Okay, so I'm going to um, open up a new R uh, session. Um, I hope you can see the screen. And as usual, I'm going to save this file. So make it a practice, make it a habit. Um, yeah, this is let's go. Right. Um, just because this is a new R session, I have to import the data set once again. Um, so I would um, why is this not? So my uh, infants data set is a text file. Um, so I'm going to import it like this. It's in my desktop, so I'm going to browse, browse it. I keep everything um, as default because I can see the data frame is appearing to be um, uh, as I needed. So I would import it. Right. Um, and probably I would attach the data set so that I can use the variable names as they are. Right. Um, so today we are going to learn a function. Um, yeah, before that, constructing tables, you all know. Um, these are the variables that we have in the data set, ethnic, smoking, breastfeed, age, pre-weight, their weight, likewise. Um, so if you are interested in constructing a table, if you want to have count data of a particular variable, we know to give the command that is, um, this is the word table, and you give the uh, variable out here. So I want to uh, get the counts of um, the variables Moki. We had uh, a couple of categories there. We want, if you're interested to see um, the counts, we have that here, and we run it. So we have 10 heavy smokers in our data set, nine light smokers, and uh, 49 non-smokers in our data set. So we call this a one-way table. In descriptive analysis, we uh, come across these things as well. In the previous lecture, we discussed how to uh, draw a pie chart, a bar chart. So basically the graphs, the graphical representations of these. Even the tabulated form is accepted in report writing. Uh, but make sure um, when you're going into research, when you're doing a descriptive analysis, don't repeat things. Uh, if you have a pie chart for this, don't have the table. If you have a table, don't represent it graphically once again. It's not needed. Um, it's just lengthening your thesis. So that is not acceptable. Just have one of these, which is suitable. And uh, if we are interested in incorporating two variables at a time, we have to go with two-way tables. So same way, you give the command table and you give the row variable first and the column variable next, comma separated. So if I want to see the count of uh, smoking with the ethnic group, I would give like this. So remember, this is the row variable. This is the column variable. You can interchange, doesn't matter. If I run this, I'm getting a table like this. So for rows, we have uh, gotten heavy smoker, light smoker, and non-smoker. Uh, so uh, we basically call this uh, Two-way table, there are several names given to this. Two-way table. Um, or you can say um, contingency table. Uh, 
uh, you can either have uh, to row totals and column totals here when you're manually doing this, but R gives you just the counts of each and every uh, intersection. So we have three black people who are heavy smokers. That is how you interpret this table. So you can really get outputs like um, but when report writing, it's not enough to put up this table, copy paste this table to your report and have it just like that. You have to interpret the table, you have to extract use, useful information. See, you see something interesting here. In this data set, we don't have light smokers uh, whose ethnic group is Hispanic. So in our data set, Hispanic people are not light smokers, either they are heavy smokers or non-smokers. We have more uh, non-smokers in Hispanic category, right? So those are the things that you can interpret from these tables. When it comes to computational statistics, true that you learn how to generate these things, but that is not enough to have to interpret. So this is the code for generating. So when you're given the code, you can generate this. It's not enough when it comes to practice. You have to extract information. You, you don't have to interpret each and every cell value. So these are cells, right? These are intersections. You don't have to interpret everything. Just extract in, uh, important information out of this table. Um, interesting, interesting information. Uh, for your analysis, uh, which suits with your objectives, so you can choose and interpret the data. So this is something interesting. There are no light smokers in Hispanic category, right? Even you can take the totals and um, go with those interpretations. However, this is how you do a two-way table or a contingency table. If you interchange these two, you will be getting a transposed version of this. So have that as well. Just because these are categorical variables, uh, you can um, have it either way, which is convenient to you, uh, which uh, the way that you like to have it, uh, both these are correct. So it doesn't have to, uh, go with like, okay, this is the row variable. No, you don't have to uh, uh, matter that those things you can have, uh, you can choose uh, which variable you're taking as the row and which as the column. Okay, and uh, three-way tables, if you're interested about three, <coughs> sorry, if you're interested about uh, having three uh, variables together, uh, with some um, uh, with some quantity, not just count, but with some quantity, you go for three-way tables. And there are a couple of methods in contrast uh, con uh, constructing three-way tables. Uh, but the second method is the best. So I'll um, teach you the first method, method one of constructing. Three-way tables. Um, so let's say uh, you want to uh, incorporate uh, three variables. Let's say uh, three categorical variables. Let's say smoking, ethnic, and uh, best breastfeed, right? Uh, so you're not interested about count. You are going to have uh, those things by age. That is a quantitative variable. Um, so you're going to have the mean of it. Let's say you want to have the mean age uh, of those three uh, smoking, ethnic, and breastfed variables, mean age you're interested in. So if that is the case, you can simply go with T apply. This is a new command that you're going to learn today. T apply. So when you press enter, you are getting these, right? Uh, so here, the vector of uh, values that you want to have the function. So if you want uh, to compute the mean, right? So the function is, that you have to give any, you can either give an inbuilt function or use a defined function, a function defined by you. But so far we haven't learned how to 
construct our own functions. So mean, median, standard deviation, those things are inbuilt in R. So you can simply call one of the functions which you are interested about. So if you want um, to have the average age um, of, the, of your sample, when you incorporate three variables, because it's a three-way table, this is how you do. As the first argument, you give the quantitative variable. So basically, age in our data set. There are so many quantitative variables. Uh, this one, this one, this one, this one, right? So for the moment, I'm taking age. And as index, you can give um, the, the three variables that you're interested about as a list. So you have to use that knowledge how to give a list. So you have the word list. And uh, let's say you want to have smoking. Ethnic. Breastfeed, right? Uh, and you want to get the mean of age at each and every category. So let's see what we are having here. So mean is an inbuilt R function. If you have a set of values, so when you print age, you have a set of values, a vector of values. Mean of this is simply the average, but we are not going to average out the entire set. We are going to average this age by categorizing uh, this particular vector under these three. So that is why uh, we construct something like this. So when we press control enter, we are getting a very messy table. That's why I said method one is not going to work that well. So yes and no. Uh, so smoking, the first variable comes as this. So this is a three-way table. We cannot show up 3D things in 2D play, right? So Yes and no is uh, they are the categories of the first variable that you have smoking. Mm -hmm. So for non smokers, sorry, uh, sorry, uh, the, for the third variable, for the last variable, you are going to have this breakdown uh, whether uh, the infant is breastfed or not. So uh, for those who uh, are not breastfed, this is the, uh, so within this one, this is the combination of smokers and the ethnic. So here, the first variable is always the row variable. Second variable is always the column variable. And third variable is going to be the breakdown. So you are having two tables here. This is very messy because, um, this really doesn't make any sense if the if the end user doesn't know um, what the variables are, you have to say. Uh, and this is not nice. This is not that nicely constructed. So there is another uh, method that you can use. So I'm, I'm encouraging you to use that method. So what are these values? These values are average age of combinations of these variables. So heavy smoker, we filter out the ages of heavy smokers who are black and who are not breastfed. We are going to filter out the ages of these three. And then we are going to take the average of the age. That is what's basically done here. Right? What does this mean? You filter out uh, the non-breastfed uh, infants who are light smoker, who, whose parents are, whose mother is light, uh, a light smoker and a um, white person. And if you average out the ages, you are getting this, right? Um, so something like that. So this table is not very nice. So I'm going to incorporate the second method. The arrangement is not that I catch it. 
Um, so this is the second method, which is recommended. Um, F table. This is another function in our F table. And you're going to run this particular code within the brackets. So I'm going to copy that and paste it here. Let's see how that shows upon. So here, this table is uh, quite nicer, right? Here we have um, the values are the same. The values are the same as this here. We are getting two different tables, but these things have come as columns in this and we have a complete single table, which is nicer, which is nicer than this. This is here. We have two different tables. Here, the arrangement is nicer. Uh, so here, the first variable is smoking, which is the row variable. Second variable is the ethnic. Again, a row variable, but going under each and every category in the original row variable. And the third variable has become your columns. So this is the arrangement of this particular function. So this method is better if you want to have a three-way table. So it's not uh, uh, the case that you have to work with age only. You can go with any other um, quantitative variable uh, in this setting. So as a list, you are giving the three categorical variables that you are interested upon. And uh, whatever the function it is, basically we go with the mean. You can either go with the median or uh, variance or standard deviation or any other function which is defined by you. You can give it here. And here, the quantitative variable where you want to apply this function. So age is averaged out here. If you take the median ages, you are taking the median of the age. Let's try that as well. There's a function, inbuilt function called median. So you're getting the median ages under these categories. Likewise, uh, you can uh, draw interesting observations out of a data set by using these techniques. Is that clear? Even you can uh, have uh, summary tables for um, two variables. Um, so there are very different ways of uh, getting tables. You don't have to include everything in your report, uh, but you can do all these, try all these, and whatever makes sense, whatever uh shows you up something interesting you can add to the report when you are writing the report you don't have to include everything so summary tables you can use uh this particular command t applied um you always give the quantitative variable first so for example let's take age and as the index, you are going to give the qualitative variable, let's say smoking. And as the function, you give the mathematical function that you want to incorporate here. So you are going to have an average age under different categories of smoking. If you give mean here. Let's see. So this is the average age of a heavy smoker in your data set. This makes sense, right? This is the average age of a light smoker. 
in your data set. This is the average age of a non-smoker in your data set. So seemingly, uh, we can see um, among these, th these are not very, um, you know, different ages, like everybody is in 20s. Uh, but on average, you can say uh, people on and about 25 tend to uh, be non-smokers in the sample. It's always about the sample, not about the entire population. Uh, you can say very young people uh, seem to be heavy smokers. You can, in the sample, always use the word in the sample. When you're interpreting a table like this, you always have to uh, say the phrase in the sample. Remember that that is super important. Even in a uh, graph, so all the descriptive analysis techniques are going to the sample. So in your sample, uh, young, younger people seem to be heavy smokers. So likewise, you can um, interpret this table. Or you can say uh, people in age 22, on average, people in age 22 are heavy smokers. So things like that. So that is how you get a summary table. Even for a, for a two-way table, you can do this. Um, let's say you want to have uh, the same thing uh, in two different um, categories, two different variables. So let's copy down. You're going to average out the age of uh, age by, uh, let's say, smoking and uh, ethnic group. So you are going to have it as a list. So these are the averaged age, ages of uh, these combinations. So on average, uh, age of 23, black people are heavy smokers. This is how you interpret. On average, uh, people at the age of 24, uh, white people at the age of 24 are non-smokers. So things like that, you can say. Uh, if it is making sense, you can see 24 here and here. So black and white, there's, seemingly there's no difference between black and white people when it comes to non-smokers. On average, um, black and white people who are aged around 24 are non-smokers. You can combine things and interpret when you're interpreting. You don't have to interpret just one cell at a time. You can combine things, you can see this. It is. Uh, it all depends uh, the way you look at the, the output. So it is subjective to the person. If I get six reports, it should not, they should not be identical. If you are asked to write a report on something, there's no particular marking scheme for that. The thing is, you cannot do wrong things. You cannot misinterpret things. It is solely depending on how you see the output. So it's very interesting. That is how. So uh, when you're very keen about the research, um, you you tend to extract more interesting information out of these faster. So for the moment, it's okay if you uh, tend to feel this is hard. No, this is not hard. Just see. Uh, just write what you see. If you are asked to write a data set, uh, a report, just write what you see. You can either combine results, um, so it's up to you. But make sure you uh, spit out all the interesting observations. Not all, but whatever it is interesting, you have to spit it out. Otherwise, your research is going to be a waste if you don't see interesting observations. So that is up to you. Practice that. Um, right. Uh, it's not just counts and averages and medians and all that. You can um, go with proportions. 
uh, if you are interested in getting proportions of earlier case, we got counts. So these are counts in contingency table, the one-way table, two-way table, these things. We got counts, count data. It doesn't have to be count all the time. You can go with proportions, you can go with percentages, right? If you don't want to see counts, if you want to have row-wise or column-wise proportions, still that is facilitated with our studio. So, um, Let's say you construct it. You first have to construct the count table. So I'll call it tab. I'll just assign it to a variable. You can assign it to objects, not variable objects. So if you want to um, have this table assigned to some object, you simply have to put this mark and give whatever the name you like. Be careful. Uh, I don't give the same name to all the tables, change it. Um, because things uh, tend to mess up uh, and uh, when it comes to overwriting. So please uh, be concerned about that. So first of all, um, I'm going to tease this out with a two-way table. Uh, so let's say we are going to have a two-way table for ethnic group and smoking. Um, so how do we create that table? Ethnic smoking. So you can just run and see. Okay, this is basically the count table. This is by default. If you are interested in getting the proportions, uh, what you should do is uh, there's a inbuilt function in R called prop dot table. So first you have to construct the count table and put that table in this. So when you have this one, you're getting uh, the proportions for the entire table. What does that mean? I'll just run and show you. This is not a recommended way. How have they computed this proportion? Both row-wise and column-wise, they have considered all the data together as one and then constructed this proportion, which is not very um, convinced, logically convincing. Uh, we have to go either row-wise or column-wise as a norm. Uh, but still, this is, act, this is uh, people represent things like these, but um, not very appealing. Uh, so how this proportion is, um, con uh, is computed is by adding all these observations together. Um, and three over summation of all these comes here. Six over summation of all these comes here. Zero over summation of all this, it's zero. 20 over summation of all these comes here. You can represent it like that, doesn't matter, but uh, it's better to go either row wise or column wise according to your interest. So this is, uh, this gives you proportions entirely. If you want to take row wise proportions, that means proportions uh, in rows, you um, take the summation of these three, take the proportions. Three over summation of three is three gives the proportion of black people uh, who are heavy smokers, it's likewise. So how do you do that? You copy and paste this entire line. If it is row wise, you just put a comma and give one, because one at the first place we give rows and at the second place we give columns basically. So you can simply run this line 
So when you add these three up, you should get one. That is the meaning. When you add these three together, you should get one. When you add these three together, you should get one. Right? So in here, when you add all these together, you should get one because it's a proportion entirely taking, taking by taking all these um, counts. Here, you're getting a row-wise proportion table. So when you add all these things, you should get one. Right? If you're interested in having column-wise proportions, simply you have to uh, make the change in the number, your second argument as two. When you add all these, you are getting one. Add all these, you are getting one. Likewise, it's column-wise proportions. So out of the heavy smokers, you have 30% of black people. Out of the heavy smokers, you have 10% of Hispanic people. That is how you interpret, right? How do you interpret this table? Out of all the people, you have 4% uh, of black and heavy smokers. So it's not really nice, you know, this is not a nice way to interpret. It's very long, the sentences are very complex and uh, that is not that sensible, it's not straightforward. That is why it is recommended to go either row-wise or column-wise with the way uh, it interests you. So this is very interesting. You can say out of all the black people, 12% are heavy smokers. You can say something like that. Out of all the Hispanic people, 8%, approximately 8% are heavy smokers. Here, how can you say out of all the light smokers, 55% are white people, if you want to interpret this one. Right. Um, so learn to interpret as well. Um, I'll give you time to write the interpretations. If you have questions in interpreting, please ask. Just write an interpretation for this one and this one so that you know how to interpret the rest. You can say 0 0.12 of a proportion or simply you can multiply this by 100 and say 12%. This is row wise and this is column wise. Out of all the black people, 12% are heavy smokers. Out of all the heavy smokers, 30% are black. Okay. I want you to get this to the shop. Um, um, can you interpret this? So this is the row wise table, row wise proportions table. Uh, how do you know that you add these things and see whether you're getting one, right? Um, so this is just take this table, write the interpretation of this one in the chat room and um, let me know whether you understood this properly. This is the row wise table. Even if I didn't tell that, you should be able to know that. Right? So interpret this particular one non smoker, black, 72%. So interpret this one and put as a direct message in the chat room so that I can make sure you have gotten this properly. 
Okay, I got a couple of uh, answers. Um, yes, out of all uh, black people, 72% are non-smokers. Uh, um, no, I think um, I have to read it out one by one. Uh, one person has told, I think it's okay to read out the index number so that you can clearly get this. So, A's 2018 504. Uh, he or she has said, out of all black people, 72% are non smokers, which is correct. That is the way because this, this uh, proportion is computed by adding all the counts here. And uh, taking the considering the count in this cell, right? So the proportion, the ratio between the count of this particular cell and the total of this row. That is how this is computed. Uh, it's like three plus four plus eighteen. That is uh, eighteen uh, plus seven which is uh, 25, 18 over 25. That is how you compute this. So out of all the black people, 72% are non-smokers. Out of all the black people, 72% are non-smokers. That is correct. Next one, uh, 481. He or she has said out of all non-smokers, 72% are black people. That is not the, uh, so you have interchanged the uh, interpretation. Good that I gave you to interpret. Out of all the non-smokers, 72% are black, black people mean you are getting the summation here. So that is not uh, represented by this one. That is this one. This table, yes, 37%, approximately 30%. Out of all the non-smokers, 37% are black people. That is correct. See, uh, even the figure is changed, right? Out of all the non-smokers, so that means you have to add all these in this column. Out of these, this much of a percentage are black. So that interpretation is incorrect. Please change that. Um, Next one, out of all the black smokers, there are 72% non-smokers. Does that make sense? 474, index number. Out of all the black smokers, when you take all the black people who are smoking, that is what it means by out of all the black smokers, right? There are 72% non-smokers. So out of smokers, how can you have non-smokers? There's a problem in wording. So you have to reword it. So you have to say out of all the black people, black people, the smokers word should be replaced by people, right? There are 72% of non smokers I think that is a careless mistake. Um, so when you write the sentence, please read it uh, and make sure it makes sense. Next one, 308. Out of all black people, 72% are non-smokers. That is correct. 343, 72% non-smokers are black. Hmm. 72% non-smokers are black. It uh I know you have uh you have tried um to get the idea, but the idea is not clear with that sentence. 72%, uh, so you can say like this, 72% of non-smokers are black. So the word of should be there, otherwise it doesn't give out a meaning. Uh, 343, uh, your interpretation is good, very creative. So without using out of all, you have uh, given out simply. So you can say 72% of non-smokers are black. That is correct. So thank you for responding. Uh, so I'll post the answer, correct answer in the chat room. 
so that all of you all can um, get it. Out of all the black people, 72% are non-smokers. Right, I hope you all understood it. Uh, just because many uh, made mistakes, can you all interpret this one? So this is the column wise table. Now don't panic, take your time. This is the column wise table. How do you recognize that when you add all these things, you are getting one. One means 100%, right? When you add this column wise, you are getting 100%, okay? So interpret this one, 0 0.6, or as a percentage, it's 60%, right? Please interpret this one and put a direct message in the chat room. Take your time. Okay, I'm getting a couple of answers. Um, out of all heavy smokers, 60% are white people. Correct. 308, your answer is correct. Um, 504, out of all heavy smokers, 60% are white. Yes. There are... Um, there are 60% white heavy smokers. Is 2018 474? I think you have to reword it. Uh, your answer says there are 60% white comma heavy smokers, which means, uh, which means to me is there are 60% white and heavy smokers. So the table that you have interpreted is the very first table that we created, this one. So there are 60% of white and heavy means white and heavy smokers. So it's not 60%, right? According to your interpretation, it should not be 60%. It should be 8%. 8%. Uh, out of everyone, eight only 8% 8 are white and heavy smoking. So your interpretation um, means this. Uh, so you have interpreted this one, uh, which is the first table. But I asked you to interpret this one. So remember, this is column-wise table. So out of all the heavy smokers, how many whites are there, right? Uh, so please revert that. Uh, it's okay to go wrong. Uh, so only if you go wrong, I can teach you. This is the mistake. That is how I can teach you. If you don't go wrong or if you copy other people's answer, I cannot correct you. So it's really okay to go wrong, but at the exam, don't go wrong. Uh, I hope you understood it. Uh, is 2018 341 out of all heavy smokers, 60% are white people, correct? Uh, 481 out of all heavy smokers, 60%, yes, correct? Three, four, three out of all heavy smokers, three, sixty percent are white. Yeah, four, seven, four. Yes, answer is correct. Now I think y'all have gotten it. Um, so please be careful when you're interpreting a table. You have to consider all those matters. It seems easy, but it's not really. So uh, don't buy hard things. Just see how these proportions have come up. This, these proportions are computed. If you see that, it's very easy to interpret. So always know what you do. Uh, just by hearting the syntax, running these are very easy. Of course, this is open book. You don't even have to buy heart. The thing is, you have to remember the places where you have made the notes down. That is not enough. At the exam, if you are asked, if you are given an interpretation and uh, ask you to write the code, to get that interpretation. So there are three possible options. You have to choose between, you can't do guesswork. So you have to be mindful in that. So make sure you go with the interpretation because this is not uh, pro R as a programming language. That is not the course. The course is computational statistics. So you have to know the statistical concepts. Um, okay, good. So I think you understood that. Uh, 
that is i think that is all i think we have to do uh, with the infants data sets so far we have advanced analysis but we are not going that far because we are uh, in the beginning of regression analysis course so you you all have not done uh, a proper simple linear regression and a multiple linear regression at all so um, i'm not going to discuss regression analysis at this point i'm going to keep it to the end i am uh, going to show you some descriptive analysis with some features of r and of course the most important part uh, writing functions okay so next part the second part of today's lecture is generating random numbers from known distributions you have learned many distributions binomial bernoulli poisson uh, exponential gamma distribution normal distribution uh, so there are so many other distributions as well beta distribution pareto distributions there are so many other distributions so for the moment we are going to see a couple of uh, uh, random number generations from uh, basically non distributions okay, so i'll mend that random number generations okay um so this is the syntax uh just because it is a random number you start with r r for random right let's say you want to uh, extract a sample from a binomial distribution you give r by norm okay and you open up the bracket when you open it up you can see n means the sample size right and uh then you give uh, sorry n sorry n is the number of trials in a binomial distribution what are the parameters number of trials and the success probability in a binomial distribution you have success and failures what are the two parameters number of trials when you toss a coin how many times that you toss the coin is going to be your number of trials if you are interested about the random variable of number of heads obtained so what is the success probability the proportion of heads that you obtained after tossing the coin right something like that so r by n n is number of trials so let's say uh you have um 10 10 number of uh, trials right and you want to generate a random number just one random number from binomial distribution so you press one and let's say success probability is 0.6 sorry uh sorry i missed that this is sorry this is the sample size this is the number of trials this is um the success probability so let me repeat that um um so first you have to give the sample size you mean that means you want 10 numbers from a binomial distribution right and number of trials just interchange these two number of trials and success probability if you miss this out you can simply go to help and see argument order in size and probability although they have given size as the second argument this should be interchanged n i thought n means number of trials see uh, just by looking at the pop up right when you type r by norm this is a good lesson for both of you and me both the parties right whenever you type this you see n size and probability by seeing the word size 
it tends to feel like okay this is the sample size the um, number of values that you have to draw from that uh, distribution it's not although they have given the word size here that means if you go to help they have defined the word properly size is number of trials number of times that you cross the coin n is the sample size number of observations so let's think you want uh, to uh, generate uh, just one number sample size okay just one number out of 20 trials where the success probability is 0.5 you are getting 10 just one number if you want 100 of these you are getting so this is basically the sample size if you have the binomial distribution out of that distribution you are drawing random numbers what are the parameters number of trials and success probability okay so what does this mean you are drawing 100 numbers from a binomial 20 comma 0.5 distribution so i write it that um draw 100 observations observations from I write it in the usual notation so that you will, you will uh, see this properly from this distribution. Okay. So if I want to draw just one number, I just have to change the sample size out of the same distribution. Now there's a problem. Earlier, can you see, when I compile this code, I got 10. Now I'm getting nine. I recompile this, I'm getting nine. I recompile this, I'm getting seven, something else. Why? Because this is random number generation right so there's a technique to fix this number so there are six of you if you type this particular code line you may be getting six different numbers out of a binomial 20 comma 0.5 distribution that is the expectation because it is random it depends on the time or uh, there, there is a dependency. I don't know how R uh, gives you out uh, random numbers, maybe with the time, maybe the version. Uh, even in the same version, when I compile this code line two times, I'm, three times, I'm getting two different observations. When I compile it once again, I'm getting something else, right? Again, I'm getting something else. When I keep on compiling this code line, I'm getting different, different numbers, right? So that is why it's called random, okay? All these are correct. If you uh, want to get the same number repeatedly um, at any uh, time that you compile the code, there is a technique right? You have to set the seed. You are calling it set the seed. Set dot seed means you are uh, to the computer, you are starting from that point when generating things, okay? You can give any number here. I just give one. You can give one, 40, 50, any, any integer here. When you set the seed and then compile this one, you are getting nine. Okay, when you come keep on compiling this different several times, you are getting different different values, right? But when you uh, why because you said you set it you set the seed and you compiled it once, 
you're getting nine. Whenever you set the seed and compile it, you are getting nine. It's not nine for all of you, right? When you keep on compiling with set dot seed, you are getting nine. Why? Because this program starts from the seed one, right? When you set the seed, let's say 40 in any number, right? When you compile this line once again, you are not getting this one because you compiled it randomly, right? Right? But when you compile these two lines together, that means you are setting the seed to 40 and then you are generating the number. Again, you are setting the seed to 40 and then you are generating the number. You should get 11 all the time. So you can place any number here. Um, so at the exam, if I ask you to do something like this, I if I want to expect the same answer from you all, I have to give you a seed and you have to run that. And remember when you are running, always run the seed because even though you run the seed one time and you keep on running this, this thing, you are not getting uh, the required thing. Okay, so always uh, initially set the seed and thereafter you're getting the same result. So um, that is about set, setting the seed. Why you set seed is because you can regenerate. You can uh, um, reuse. There is a reusability when you set the seed and start. Otherwise, all these numbers are accepted. All, all these are coming from binomial 20, 0.5, right? All these values are coming from that distribution. True. But if you want to reproduce something, if you want to reuse uh, a previous result that you obtained out of because you won't be generating a single number and that's it. You won't be doing that. You are generating a number for some purpose, right? So if that is the case, it's important setting the seed first so that you can, it, it uh, doesn't matter um, at what time you run the code, you run the R script, it doesn't really matter. You can close this, you can open it up back again and then recompile it. Still, you are getting the same random number. It doesn't have to be just one random number. It can be many. Uh, so let me set the seed once again for some other value. You can give any value to 100, though, I think. So let's say I want I want 20. Um, I will give another one. Uh, I want eight random numbers. So what I have to do is setting the seed to whatever it is and run this, I'm getting eight observations. So that is that, right? If I want to get exactly these numbers once again, I have to run the seed once again and this one. If I keep on running only this line, I'm getting different, different numbers from the same distribution. Getting different numbers. Within that, there are repetitions because they are random numbers. Uh, so somebody is asking, what's the purpose of giving a seed number? So that is to reproduce the result. Of course, you are getting random numbers. If you give the seed, you are starting from that position and then you are generating a number, right? When you close this program and when you open it, uh, it up once again, after some time maybe, and when you run the code, you're getting a different set of numbers. In case if you want to see the same set of numbers that you generated initially, it's important setting a seed. That is the importance of this. Let's say you are writing a research paper. You are you want to generate random numbers out of a particular binomial distribution and publish your data. So if, we, if this keeps on changing, how can you publish values? Let's say you are publishing 
not basically random numbers by using this you are manipulating something you are having some function and uh, let's say from that uh, you are going to find something in your research and uh, maybe you are posting out your out a standard error you are saying your finding is better than what is existing something like that so you have to show it by numbers this is the speed of the existing one this is the speed of my own function you can say something like that and show that my speed is better than the other one speed result so when it comes to error you can say um there's a function uh, let's say if, let's take a simple example for finding mean there's an r inbuilt function okay so you take that and uh, you are finding the error you are checking the error let's say you can do it with the mean function just take some function in r um calculating up to a certain number of decimal places let's say right so in r uh, in r there should be an inbuilt function for that and you are taking the error the gap between uh, the function output and the real value let's say you create your own function to do the same thing and the error is less so you are going to publish it if you make use of generating random numbers for the process of course you are going to do simulation analysis for that then you have to publish numbers in the in the research paper what if these keep on changing your errors keep on changing because uh, to make your publication published or accepted by the journal's author he or she has to reproduce your results and see whether you have uh, given out um, accurate information you can simply type numbers and give you can't do that uh you have to uh, produce all these r scripts and all the re regenerating stuff uh to the particular authorized person so that he or she can check what you have done so if these keeps on changing you can never publish your uh, article so that is one application uh so the basic idea is if you want to reproduce something re reuse the same thing that you generated before you have to make use of this this is super important i think i answered your question okay right so it's not only the binomial distribution that we have we have so many other distributions so let's check a couple of other distributions as well if you want to generate a random number from poisson distribution right so the only parameter it has is the parameter lambda poisson lambda so you have that is the rate parameter so you have to give uh, a value to lambda and generate numbers so r for random for poisson distribution you have to type poise r poise the first argument is the sample size so if you want to generate one random variable one number one random number you give it as one and you give the parameter lambda value here let's say four you are getting just a number so when you keep on compiling this you are getting so many values if you didn't set the same right if you want to generate uh, 20 numbers from the same distribution you are getting 20 numbers if you didn't set the seed you are getting different different uh, ways this is different this is different this is different 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 this is same different 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 like this when you run you can get so the syntax is um i'm not going to write the syntax all the time because you can use the help command to see what these arguments really mean so basically this is the sample size and this is lambda or the rate parameter so generating 
random numbers from a normal distribution. Let's see. Um, R for random, norm for normal. So what are the parameters that we have? First, we have to give the sample size. So let's say we want 30 numbers. Um, so we can give uh, a, a, the value for the parameter mean, which is mu, let's say eight and standard deviation five. We are getting 30 numbers from this distribution. So I'll write that we are getting 30 random numbers from normal eight comma um I should say 25. Why did I write 25? You have to be mindful in that. So it says our norm, this particular function, uh, enables you to generate um, a given set of random numbers from a normal distribution given the mean and the standard deviation. But when we are writing it in this notation, x is normally distributed with this um then write the binomial pocket if x is our random variable this is how we write right um okay so if x is our random variable it says Usually, uh, the way of writing this notation is normal mu and sigma squared, but not sigma. Sigma squared is the variance. But here in this particular function in R, they take mean and the standard deviation as inputs. So if we have a statement like this, it means we have generated 30 random numbers from a normal distribution where the mean is eight and the standard deviation is five. But when we are writing the notation by using this notation, you have to write correctly. You can't write five here because if that is the case, you have to write root five here. Okay, so be careful with that. Um, don't mix it up. So this is from normal 8, 25. If you have questions, please ask. Um, I would better write this one as well. If I write like this, you can um, easily identify this is uh, the sample size and this is the uh, parameter lambda. Okay, um, so if you are if you want to generate from the exponential distribution, it is R E X T, and you have to give the sample size and the rate parameter. So if we want two numbers where the rate parameter is five you're getting values. So um, if you want to uh, get from a chi-square distribution, R chi-square, that is the expression. So uh, N is the sample size, let's say you want two values and usually in chi-square distribution, you give the degrees of freedom, that is the parameter. Degrees of freedom, let's say four, just forget about this non-centrality parameters. So just keep it as it is, zero. Uh, you call it the non-centrality parameters. So that is an advanced way of chi-squares. So this is the basic chi-square that we are considering starting from zero. That is what it means, starting from zero, non-centrality parameter. So for that chi-square distribution, you can get numbers. 
I'll just comment it like exponential. It's chi square. You can search and see uh, how to um, generate random numbers from other distributions as well. Uniform distribution, F distribution, T distribution. From all these distributions, you can generate random numbers. You can search and see. Um, okay, so that's uh, quite a lot. You can search and see these are the basics. Um, so what you have to remember is the first argument is always the number of observations or that is the sample size. The next few observations are going to be your parameters basically. So uh, giving it in the particular order is uh, up to you. You have to know that. Um, so that is all about random number generation from known distributions. Mm. And the last half of today's lecture is teaching you control structures. Uh, that is if statement, else statement, loops. Um, so we are discussing basically the for loop and the while loop. Uh, I think it's better to uh, give you the syntax before going for examples. Give me a second. So under control structures, we're going to discuss if, else, and so these are basically for uh, testing a condition. If this happens, do this, otherwise do that. So you test a condition. If this happens means if the condition happens. Okay, so you use this for testing a condition. Computer science people know this. Others can know now, by now from now onwards. So for and while they are loops, okay? to execute <clears throat> execute a loop right um, so both these are for loops um, so i would say we use for loop to execute for a uh, for a fixed number of times. If you know the number of times that the particular loop, the particular repetition happens, um, you go with the for loop. Initially, you have to know how many times this particular loop has to repeat. If you are doing the same thing repeatedly, you don't have to write the same code million times. You can simply write the code one time and put it to a loop. If the loop should execute a million times, you have to give, okay, it should repeat from one to million, right? Likewise, you have to know the number of times that it should iterate. If that is the case, you can use for loop. This is the uh, general uh, and uh, commonly used loop. But there are instances where you do not know uh, exactly the number of times you don't have the idea, but you know a condition uh, which satisfy, uh, which should satisfy to end the loop, right? So this is executed while a condition is true.
this particular loop executes until the condition gets false. When the condition is false, it goes out of the loop. While it is true, as long as the condition is satisfied, as long as the condition is true, it iterates, it executes the loop. Okay, looping means repeating, doing the same thing repeatedly over and over again. So basically, we are going to learn uh, these things under control, control structures. There's many uh, repeat command, break, next, return. But for now, we are discussing only um, these four control structures. Any questions? Any um, issues with this? I'm going to give you the syntax. But so far, uh, can you distinguish between these two? Do these feel like the same? Uh, if, if you have to understand the difference between these two, otherwise, you know, you have to have some repetition, but you don't know which loop to use. So that is going to be problematic. Four loop is used when there's a fixed number of times that you know uh, how to iterate. And <clears throat> while loop is used, uh, if you know a condition and while that condition is true, you can use this loop. You are not concerning about the number of iterations. You don't know. You can make notes on this. Um, so when it comes to the syntax, syntax is like the grammar in programming. Syntax for if statement. You have simply the if condition. So uh, how do you give that is if within brackets, you give the condition And view open up in um, curly brackets, right? And then you do something here. It's like, if something happens, do this. Uh, it said my uh, battery is low in my Bluetooth device. In case if you um, if you if I lag, just let me know, right? Okay. Otherwise, I would be keep on uh, teasing this. So yeah, just make make me note about that as well. So the second one is um, if statement with else so that is basically if you give the condition here open the bracket you do something and close the bracket right if this is not happening you can do something else so you write the word else here, do something else, and close the bracket, right? We'll write functions for these. And uh, I'll write the third one, uh, which is under if else. So that is nested if. Nested if means you have so many conditions to check, right? For example, if you write the condition here, 
open bracket, you do something mm -hmm. and close the bracket. Right? Else, you just don't have one thing to do like this. Else, if, once again, if this thing do something, else, if some other condition do something, Okay, so likewise, you can go until uh, you meet all the conditions, right? So I don't put dots here just because this is the syntax. Uh, so you can have else if, else if, else if, else if many number of times. And this is the final statement. If any of the above conditions are not met, you do something. That is nested if. Don't panic. These are not hard, hard things. When we do examples, when we are writing functions, you will learn all these. You, you will uh, make sense about these things. So don't worry. Just copy this down. I'll give you a little time to copy this down. Okay, I think uh, this is understood. Um, we'll see uh, those things with an example, with, a, with simple examples. So before that, I'm going to give syntax for the for loop and the while loop. So let me clear these off. So simple for loop is, Mm -hmm. you give a variable here okay let's say i in you give the range uh, the starting point and the ending point separated by a semicolon here start end open bracket close bracket you do something here Right, so this is starting from some point, you are iterating it up to this point. That is what it means. So within the code, we are making use of this I. You can put any letter here, I, or even any uh, word here, doesn't matter. This is just a variable, right? Usually we use for I in. In is a technical word. It's a keyword here. Right, you, you have to have it there. Um, so circle that out. This is a technical word term or a key term. This is a key term. This colon should be there or else you have to give the vector. Sometimes the colon is not there. It's like um, if you assign x, say uh, one to 100, you simply can do x here instead of this one because this colon is almost there, right? Basically, you are giving a vector of values here, starting value and the ending value. Okay, so that is the simple for loop. And you um, also can have nested for loop. Uh, so within a for loop, you can have another one, right? For i in uh start value to end value you can have things here and within that you can have another j in start value it can be a different starting value it should be So you do something here, you can do something here, even you can do something here, doesn't matter. We'll discuss these things later on. So um, 
this happens like this. So let's say, um, okay, I in one to 10, let's say, right? Say J in uh, one to five, right? So I, when I is equal to one, you go here, right? And when i is equal to one, j takes values one to five. If you don't understand, it's okay, right? I'm just telling you this, the mechanism of this, okay? When i is equal to one, it goes here, i is equal to one and j can take values from one to five. That means iterations, they are iterative. i takes its first value, go to this loop, I take this first value, go to this loop and iterate this many number of times and then end it, go back to the loop, okay? Then I becomes two, right? When I is equal to two, again, J goes from one to five, one, two, three, four, five, it iterates five times and then go back to this loop. That is how the mechanism is set for. When i is equal to three, it uh, it becomes three. It goes to this loop. It goes to this loop, and this particular thing iterates this many times: one, two, three, four, five. If it is going from one to five, right? So likewise, i goes from one to ten. So this particular loop entirely repeats. 10 times in this example. This is the simplest way that I can express this to you all. Uh, so it's like taking, iterate iterates one time and go uh, goes to the next loop, inner loop and iterate that many times in that, goes back to the next one, right? You can have many number of loops here but when you keep on adding loops, when you keep on nesting loops, one within the other, it takes a lot of time, right? Um, so you have to be mindful on that, uh, but still, if we have to do it, we have to, right? Uh, even though it takes a lot of time. Uh, just because R is a high level language, um, it's very user-friendly and it's high level language, it is more time consuming than low level languages like C, C++, C sharp and all that. But still we have to learn this. So you can have any number of uh, four loops nested one inside the other, uh, but I cannot say you can have millions of four loops. You can, you might be able to, sometimes your computer might get collapsed um it, it doesn't happen for three or four loops but going beyond that uh, so anyway i'm not giving questions like that to you uh one um one two or maximum three uh would be there so this is the mechanism of the for loop a uh, nested for loop if you have any questions ask now on nested for loop if you if you can't understand this mechanism, how this iterates. When we come up with examples, you will understand this properly. Uh, computer science students know this. Um, other students, uh, don't worry, you would get used to this. I, I just anyway have to give you some um, starting point to make you uh, understand. Otherwise I, I could have done it with an example, but it doesn't make any sense. 
that's why i had to teach this to you all uh, sometimes after doing an example you will understand what i said here if you didn't understand at this point it's okay it's okay if you didn't understand just listen then i'll talk about uh, the while loop uh, i'll give you the syntax so simple uh, while loop so you have to have a counter for um, executing uh, usually right so let's say count you assign a, a count, right? Uh, because you know you don't know the number of times that this iterates. It checks with the condition whether it satisfies or not, and that is how you execute the loop. So you have just to make it loop, you have to set a count before, right? So you set the count to be zero while this is the loop while. You can say um, just write this down. Um, do something. And you have to update the counter. So this is just a simple loop. Right, so what does this mean? Count is equal to zero. Is it less than zero? Is zero less than zero? This is a false statement, right? This is a false statement. So if this is false, it doesn't go inside the loop, it goes out. That is what it means. Again, listen. If so, this is the condition. This condition is checked whether it is true or false. If this happens, go inside. If not, go to the next line. Next line means go out of the loop. So, this loop is from here to here. Right? So, according to this, this condition is false. Zero is not less than zero, right? It goes out of the loop. Assume we have something like this. It iterates one time, right? Count is zero. So is count equal to zero? Yes. So it gets into this loop, right? It gets into this loop and do this. Do whatever the task here. And now the count is count plus one. So initially the count is zero. Zero plus one is one. Now the count is one. It goes out and checks the condition once again. Is one equal to zero? So zero equal to zero is true. One equal to zero is false. Whenever it gets false, it doesn't go inside. It goes out of this loop then this task is stopped, right? If you have something like this here, you are going to run this loop infinitely many times. Why? Initially, count is zero. Zero, yes, it gets in. Then count is updated to one. One is greater than zero. Yes, you come back into the loop. Then one plus one is two. 2 is greater than or equal to 0, condition is true, you are again running this loop. So if you have something like this, uh, sometimes your R session might collapse because this loop runs infinitely many times because this keeps on updating, right? So be careful with those things as well. If you have something like this, Right, still it iterates only one time. Zero is equal to zero. Okay. One is not less than or equal to zero, it stops. 
right? So uh, likewise, be careful with those things. Uh, even within uh, a while loop or uh, even a for loop, within any loop, you can have if conditions and statements, right? You call it uh, compound, um, um, so, sorry, you can have any number of uh, uh, things here. So in, do something, this thing can uh, go even pages, like you can do anything here. It's not just one line, right? And uh, even when giving a condition, so this is just a simple condition, right? You can have compound conditions. You can give multiple conditions at once. You can check different different conditions at once so it's something like this while uh, let's say you have um, x zero y one okay you can check while x is greater than or equal to zero and how do you give the logical and here? Two and signs will give you and and it's just like the and gate, right? This and this. Let's say y is equal to one. Do something. You can give any condition here. What I want to teach you here is this one. You can have a couple of ends here this and this and something else, right? So this is basically um, how you give the and statement. So to make this satisfied, to make this condition true, right? Both these individually should be true. Let's see. At least if one of these is false, this entire thing is going to be false. So you should, as math students, you should know that. Applied math students. Right, x and y. True means this is true. This is true. X and y. False means this can be false. This can be true. This can be true. This can be false. Or both can be false. Just because of this and sign. In R, the syntax for this and is double and. If you give a single and, it doesn't work. So let's see, x is zero, so it is greater than or equal to zero, correct. Y is one, it is equal to one, correct. So it executes the loop. When you increment it here, x equals x plus one, y equals, you can give uh, x plus one, y equals y plus two, anything you can give or even you can give minus two, doesn't matter. So if this is the case, x is initially zero, zero plus one is one, one is greater than zero, this is happening. y equals y plus two, y is initially one, one plus two is three, y is equal to three, this is false. So this and this, both are not happening, this is true, this is false, so it ends the loop, right? So. That is the idea behind this and operator. This is an operator, right? Logical operator. So you can give compo compound things. You can give uh, multiple conditions in one line, in a while loop. So just because the and statement is written by using double and sign, or statement, this or this, at least if one of these is true, you are going to execute the loop, right? So you give two vertical lines. This is the or operator. Just take a screenshot. Let's see, we have an O operator here. And we are going to check all these conditions. I'll write it in other color so that it's visible to you all clearly. So initially X is zero, Y is one, right? So let's say X equals X plus one, Y equals Y, something like this. 
you can have plus or minus or anything here. So initially it is zero, this is happening. You don't have to even check this condition. You can simply enter the loop because if at least one of these is true with the O operator, it executes the loop, right? So this is going to be an infinite loop once again because this is always true because this is incremented. Starting from zero, it increments one by one. So if you have something like this, this is going to be a never ending loop, okay? So be careful with that. When you are uh, combining conditions uh, to form compound conditions, please be careful with those things as well. Um, yeah, so um, that is it about the while loop. If you didn't understand this, it's okay. This is just to give you out an introduction to loops. When you make use of them, uh, you will realize um, all these things. I just, uh, here what I wanted to uh, teach you was uh, the logical operators, the syntaxes for logical operators and and all. There are some other things. If you, um, I'll, tell you that now not is again an operator, right? So it is basically the exclamation mark, right? If you want to check a condition, say X is equal to zero. If this happens, go inside the loop, something like that. Or you can say X is not equal to zero, go inside the loop. So. This is the AND operator, double AND sign. This is the o operator to vertical um, lines. And this is the NOT operator, exclamation marks. Now, NOT is basically coming with NOT equal, right? So this is equal and this is NOT equal. When you are programming, when you're doing functions, you will make use of this. Just make note, this is AND, this is O, and this is not. And also, if you want to check a condition, if you want to check equality, it is double equal, right? If you want to check a condition, whether it is equal to something, it's double equal. Just make note on that as well. Our program, um, uh, uh, just because we have time, um, let me show you a very simple example on loops, uh, on if conditions first and then the loops. So let's say x is equal to four, right? This is a very uh, hypothetical one. You're not going to use these things in practice just to show you what's happening inside. If you give the condition here, you can say X is greater than five. This is not true, right? You can do something, right? What do you mean by this doing something? You can print something, print X. So will this print anything? No, right, x is four. Four is not greater than five. So it shouldn't print anything. It shouldn't print anything, right? So let's make this 40. Now the condition is satisfied, right? x is 40. If x is greater than five, x is 40. 40 is greater than five. You print x. See, it prints x. It is the functionality of uh, the simple if condition. If this is not happening, you want to do something else. So you type the word else here. Make sure you write it in the same line. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Print, uh, let's say, two times x. This is how you give the times by the asterisk mark, okay? So when you run this, this condition, this if condition really satisfies, right? 40 is greater than five. So it should print 40 
it shouldn't print 80 because this is happening only if this condition is false. So when we run this entire line, we still get 40. That means they have executed this particular line. Whenever they execute the if statement, they're not going to execute the else statement because if this is happening, this is not happening, right? So let's keep our first, first thing, right? You can change these values and see, okay? I'm changing the same R script. If X is four, four is not satisfying this condition. X is not satisfying this condition. So it doesn't print X, it should go to the next one. If X is greater than five, print X, X is four, right? Else, else means either it is equal to five or less than five, okay? Else that you print two times X, so that is eight. So in this case, it should print eight. We'll see whether it's happening, yes. It doesn't, if this condition doesn't satisfy, it does not execute this particular bracket. It jumps to the next particular bracket. Okay, so that is the functionality of if and else, right? Uh, if you want to give more conditions, Right, uh, nested if. So basically you have to give else if another condition here. You can check whether X is greater than five. Or if not, you can check whether X is um, greater, sorry, simple X. Simple X is greater than four. Right. If it's not greater than five, we can check whether it's greater than four, something like that. If that is the case, print this. Else, you can give something else even. Nested if can give um, so many else if statements. Else if you can check whether x is greater than three. If that happens, you can do something. You can print. Let's say three times x, you can print anything. Or if none of these happens, something else. You are just printing a string, right? So let's see uh, our x is. I'll just copy it down here, then I can run it. X is four, is X greater than five? No, so it doesn't execute this line. Else, if X is greater than four, is X greater than four? four? X is four now, four greater than four. That is also not true. It goes to this line, is X greater than three? X is four now, four is greater than three. Yes, so it should print this one. So if we, so if in case if it prints this, if in case if it goes into this particular section, it doesn't even look at this, right? So when we run this entire code, I should get 12 because I should have this statement. Three times X is printed, others are ignored because the conditions are not satisfied. Let's say X is 0 0.04, right? It is not greater than five. It is not greater than four. It is neither greater than three. So it should print this. We'll see. Yes. 
So you can change these things and try these out, right? Um, just practice if and else. Then um, I think I explained while loop. So let's do a simple for loop. Can you see the iterations, how it goes? I in one to five. When I is equal to one, print one, iterate. When I is equal to two, yes, it is in this range, print two. I is equal to three, it's in this range, print three, likewise. When I is equal to five, it is still in this range, print five, iterate. Then I is equal to six. Six is not in this range, so it stops the loop. That's it, right? Uh, so this is a very simple one. You can even print two times, I, right? So it should print two, four, six, eight, and 10. We'll see. So if you want to print these numbers, you don't have to, um, so this is the benefit of looping, right? You don't have to uh, print like this. You don't have to type all these. If you want to print these numbers, you can simply go for a loop, right? Uh, so nested for loop. I just want to show the mechanism. I'll keep I here. I'm going to have another loop within this. So J in uh, 100 to um, hundred, hundred to um, yeah, hundred and three. Let's say I'm going to open the bracket here. So I have this alignment so that it's easy. You don't miss anything, right? When you click here, you can see the closing bracket. When you click here, you can see the closing bracket. So add spacing in a way convenient to you all, right? So if I want to print J, I just want to show you how this executes. So it should print one and then 100 to 103. Then it should print two and 100 to 103. That is the order. It's not one to five and 100 to 103. No, it's not the way. When I run that, it prints one. This is the outer loop. Then it executes the inner loop, 100, 101, 102, 103. Then goes back to the outer loop. Two and prints the, everything in the inner loop. Three prints everything in the inner loop. Likewise, it goes up to five, everything in the inner loop. When i is equal to six, it stops execution because it's not in this range. So this is the mechanism. There are so many things that we can do from these loops. I just want to uh, print these and show you the mechanism. That is the idea. So that's why I said, if you didn't understand, it's okay. When you try these things, you will realize the mechanism. Um, why loop, I think I... Um, uh, X, I showed it in the syntax. So yeah, so that is it for today. If you have questions, please ask. Um, otherwise you can leave the meeting. Thank you so much for participating for today's lecture. Um, take care and stay safe. Thank you.